You know what? Is this okay to be over here, Wes? Okay. Well, I'm kind of honored to be here. I'm very honored to be here because these two guys are pioneers in mass communications and journalism. I actually read their stuff when I was a young journalist in college, and I still remember that. And I met this young man, Mr. Tishner, a while back, and when I walked into the room this morning, he actually remembered me, which was pretty good because I'm not that memorable to most people. <laughs> But Dr. Phil Tishner is Professor Emeritus of Journalism and Mass Communications and Rural Sociology, which is an interesting combination, at the University of Minnesota. He's famous for the knowledge gap hypothesis, which says that higher socioeconomic segments of the population acquire media information at a faster rate than lower status groups, so that the gap in knowledge between these segments tends to increase rather than decrease. Famous, famous hypothesis in theory. Dr. Max McCombs, also at the University of Minnesota, one of the co-founders of the Association of Turkish and American Communication Scholars. Um, he came up with the agenda-setting hypothesis, which says mass media do not tell society what to think about issues, rather they tell society what issues to think about, which is interesting when you think about it. It says that mass media sets the agenda for what issues are important and what are not. Uh, these two pioneers will talk informally about what the era of media was like in the late 60s and early 70s uh, for them, how they developed these theories, who or what inspired them, insights into theory building, and just about anything else they think might be fun to share. Following the conversation, uh, professors who were students of these pioneers will honor their contributions by giving a brief outline of both theories and the impact the theories had on a generation of research. St. Cloud State's Roger Rudolph, Dr. Roger Rudolph, will talk about the knowledge gap hypothesis. The University of Istanbul's Dr. Sarah Gorp and Dr. Erkan, and I'll probably mess this up, but Dr. Erkan Yüksel of Anadolu University in Turkey will share insights regarding the agenda setting theory. So gentlemen, if you have designed kind of your own discussion format, so I'll give you the floor if you just want to start out without any ado. Well, Phil, why don't you talk about what was on the media agenda when we were in graduate school in the last millennium? <laughs> you know, it, Max, it was uh, September of 1960, two years after Sputnik. And Sputnik had changed the world dynamic because this was the era of the space race. And here we all thought the Americans were going to get to the moon first, we're going to put rockets in space, and the Russians beat us. That was an international and national calamity. And so we had such figures, probably long lost to world history, an American naval hero from World War II named Admiral Rickover, who said that American education is in tatters. At Minnesota, there was a dean of the Institute of Technology who said, we've got to get uh, back to the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and we've got to get away from the three T's. And what were the three T's? Typing, tap dancing, and tomfoolery. <laughs> <laughs> so what was being said, and this was part of the national media agenda, was that American education needs to get back to, the edu to education in science. And so an organization called the National Science Foundation was offering huge sums of money to study the whole problem of science knowledge in the United States and what can be done to improve that. It just so happens that my advisor at uh, Stanford, named Wilbur Schramm, was uh, a recipient of some money from the National Science Foundation. Well, I'll get to that later. Max asked what the, was, uh, else was on the media agenda. Uh, what else was on the media agenda was the new presidency of John F. Kennedy, and there was a the problem of Cuba. And Cuba was in the news, and we had a disaster called the Bay of Pigs. The American government supported a re an insurgent group that tried to land on the Bay of Pigs and take over the Cuban government. And a gentleman named Fidel Castro had a better military <coughs> force than they knew. 
and he whipped them, and so Cuba took its choice and took its particular direction. But then, Max, uh, after we were there for a, uh, a few months, America finally got a gentleman into space. It was Alan Shepard who rode a missile down the Atlantic coast and cheers, the United States was back in the space race again, but still we needed to know more about uh, science. You may recall other things, Max. Well, t thinking more generally about what was happening at Stanford, certainly uh, the program uh, Wilbur Schramm was involved in that Phil referred to as knowledge of science among the general public was an important segment. Uh, Schramm was very fond because he was, build, he was building a communication program at that time uh, where essentially little existed. There were journalism schools, there were communication studies schools that at that time tended to emphasize rhetoric. Uh, there was not the kind of communication research that we know today and that indeed we've heard a lot of uh, here. Schramm was very fond of saying Communication at that time is a crossroads where many have passed, but few have tarried. That is, there were fragments of information and research in a lot of different areas. And fortunately, Schramm set out to establish an intellectual trading post, as it were, at that crossroads. Uh, so I remember by the time I arrived at, at Stanford in the, in the fall of 1960 as a master's student. Uh, his book, Process and Effects, which was a collection of uh, what we would now regard as classical studies in the field, uh, and also a reader whose name I've long since forgotten. Uh, uh, those, were, those were kind of the core text, you know, where we, where we began to learn something about uh, the research that had begun to emerge in the social sciences about primarily mass communication uh, starting in the 1930s, uh, continuing into the 40s. Uh, much, much of that research emphasized attitude change. And by the 1950s, that line was beginning to play out. Uh, well, do you remember, Phil, there were kind of two distinct lines. Yes. There were the Hovland experimental studies, right. which showed very strong effects in the laboratory for different formats of messages and their impact on uh, uh, people's attitudes and opinions. And then there were the field studies, of which probably the best known are the Lazarsfeld election studies, 1940 Erie County, 1948 Elmira, uh, which showed very few effects on people's attitudes and opinions. And that kind of conflict between the two was uh, kind of stalling progress forward in the field. But then to pick up on that, Max, one of those Lazarsfeld studies was based on a very famous marketing study in Decatur, Illinois. It was a study largely of women who make decisions in households. And they were studying, they wanted to find out how these women made decisions about clothing buying, about food buying, and about politics. And what they found was that uh, when they got information from the media, they often were not getting this information directly, but they were getting information and influence from other people who were opinion leaders. And this led to this phenomenon, this study of opinion leadership and what was called the two-step flow of communication. And the two-step flow was one of the <laughs> top theories of yes, mass communication at, at that uh, particular time. Then it disappeared more or less for, for, I'd say, decades. And yet now, with social media, this whole area of studies resurfacing. But that's getting too far up to date. Uh, let's go, go way back. Phil, and I don't know the answer to this question. How did you decide to go to Stanford? Stanford's a long way from Minnesota. I was in New Orleans. It's a long way from New Orleans. How did we end up? I know how I ended up on the West Coast. How did you end up there? Well, Max, I got a couple of years on you, you know. Uh, in the late 50s, 
I had my military career behind me, and so I had what is called the GI Bill, a great advantage to any American student who has been in the military. I had a job at the University of Minnesota as a publicity writer for the uh, Agricultural College, the St. Paul campus of Minnesota, also called the Farm Campus, or <laughs> in more common terms, the Cow College, okay? <laughs> and as a writer, my job was to uh, write up scientific research and sociological research that had to do with agricultural knowledge and with rural development knowledge around the state of Minnesota. And we started to have communication seminars. And while I had been thinking of a, a career in magazine writing, I got interested in academics. And again, with this GI Bill, which was important to my career, I kept, I kept taking s uh, seminars at the School of Journalism, which was across town in Minneapolis. But, and I even, I liked that school so much that I said, someday I want to teach there. But I don't want to teach at the same school that gave me my degree. I want to find another place. Well, being a Midwestern boy, you know, Stanford, that never occurred to me. I was thinking maybe Illinois, maybe Iowa. So I had an advisor named Roy E. Carter, Jr., who had got, come to uh, Minnesota from uh, North Carolina, where he had taught, and he happened to have a degree, one of the first degree holders, doctorate holders, from Stanford in a program called Mass Communication Research. I thought, that's interesting for those who can get there. But he said to me one day, you know something? I think we can get you into that program. And by golly, that's where I ended up. And so there I got interested in uh, following Professor Schramm and his interest in science knowledge, and things sort of took off from there. How about you, Max? Well, I guess my, my lead sentence would be, I was the victim of a benevolent conspiracy. Uh, part of it was the influence of, of a key professor. I, had, uh, I did my undergraduate work at, at Tulane University in New Orleans, uh, and a professor I'd worked with uh, quite a bit, both taking courses from, and when I was editor of the student newspaper, he was the advisor to the newspaper. Uh, so we got to know each other quite well, a man named Walter Wilcox. Uh, as I was finishing up my senior year, he said, what are you planning to do after graduation? And I said, well, I want to get a job as a journalist. He said, before you do that, you need to go get a master's. And he didn't really say why, and uh, I kind of took him at his word, although, and then I said, well, where would be a good place to do that? And he said, well, there's only one. You need to go to Stanford. So I ended up uh, applying to Stanford, and I graduated in May, and the next September I was in California. Uh, and the Stanford program was founded by a man named Chilton Bush, and when I arrived in fall of 1960, Bush was in his last year as chair of the communication department, and he was also advisor to a great many of the graduate students, particularly the new graduate students. So I went to see him when I arrived on campus. Uh, I, uh, well, I'll give you a little bit of an uh, idea of his personality. I and about five other new graduate students are sitting in the office waiting to see him. He comes storming out of his office, throws this pile of file folders on the desk. If you've been an administrator, you've probably done the same thing many times. But maybe you didn't express your feelings as strongly as uh, Chilton Bush did. Without looking at the students who are sitting there, as he throws all these folders on the desk, he says, these goddamn students are driving me crazy. And he stalks back into his office. And about two minutes later, secretary said, you may go in now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I go in. I introduce myself. He picks up a pad. And he says, what you want to take is my content analysis course. And he writes that down. He said, uh, you need to take Schramm's theory seminar. 
he writes that down. He said, uh, go over to the psychology department, take a stat course. He writes that down. Oh, while you're there, take a learning theory course. Then he tears off the page, he hands it to me, and he says, go home and think about this and come back tomorrow. Well, of course, I had absolutely no criteria <laughs> by which to evaluate this proposed coursework. In effect, what I went there thinking, I'm going to do a master's in journalism, maybe advanced techniques of reporting or what. Basically, what I, he put me into was the first year of the doctoral program, and that's how Phil and I became friends. That stat course, we were both in Quinn McNamara's stat course. Stanford's on a quarter system. We did three quarters straight through uh, with McNamara, who, as I recall, loved to teach at about 8 o'clock in the morning. Exactly. You know, and so we would kind of st st stumble out at 9 o'clock. Fortunately, there was a big lawn on the library next door, and McNamara also had written the stat book. So it was now, okay, now let's kind of go back over what he said and kind of figure that out. Uh, so that that was one of the courses we took together. We, we didn't we we took several other psychology courses together. I'm sure we did, Max. This is an interesting thing about the disciplines that are involved in the study of mass communication. At Minnesota, I had been working with a professor named George Donahue, whose name shows up uh, fre frequently in the literature, and and he was he was my mentor at Minnesota actually. He and Roy Carter. So I was starting to get oriented toward sociology before I left Minnesota. But, but it still, this was kind of fresh because at Wisconsin, my training had really been in technical agricultural things, and I didn't really have much social and psychological science at all. Well, the Stanford program uh, led us not into psychological statistics, but also into such things as psycho, psychodynamics and learning theory. And and uh, laboratory learning theory. That, you know, I had a very good professor who did his research <coughs> with laboratory rats. And that was very interesting, and I got to thinking about, uh, about simple conditioning for conditioning attitudes and opinions. And I did a paper that he thought was great, but then I took it to a, a veteran in learning theory, and he shrugged and said, uh, huh, I don't know what you're gonna do with that. But anyway, <laughs> then we had these social psychology courses, and the whole, the, the whole program was, was really heavily oriented t toward individualistic psychology. And then, Max, tell him about this theory that was, sw that was sweeping over the campus at the time called the theory of cognitive dissonance. Yeah. And before you t explain, uh, uh, let me tell you something about it. Cognitive dissonance, the, the principal author is Leon Festinger, who had just left Minnesota six months before I went to Stanford. And since my uh, friend George Donahue was, was cross-appointed in the sociology department, he knew all about Leon Festinger. <laughs> and so I had a whole, all sorts of personal background on the guy when I went out there, and which meant that, to make a long story short, the way academic politics go, I didn't take the guy seriously. <laughs> but tell, tell him about cognitive dissonance as it was seen at that time, Max and the why it seemed to be so important? Okay. Well, I start with the background. When Festinger was still in, in Minnesota, uh, there was a, a millennium group that predicted, I don't know the year, well, let's use current date, as if there's some group now says, next April 15th, the world is going to end, you know, and they sell all their belongings and they kind of, you know, barricade themselves in a compound. Well, Festinger and I think at least two other social psychologists at Minnesota infiltrated this group uh, because what they wanted to see, and this gets at the idea of cognitive dissonance, uh, they were betting that on April 15th the world would not end, and yet these people had made this strong commitment to this. So what happens when your strong beliefs collide with an immovable reality that the world is still here. Uh, so that was kind of the 
precursor uh, of his expanded program of research. Uh, I particularly like one facet of that book of, okay, if you're doing that kind of research, it's important to kind of, you know, get a fairly detailed ethnography of the dynamics of this group day by day as this plays out. Uh, but you can't, you know, sit there with your clipboard <laughs> taking notes, and this was before the days of little tiny pocket recorders. So, you know, it was a question of how do you take notes? And Fassinger acknowledges in the, uh, in the, the book called When Prophecy Fails, uh, they went to the bathroom a lot. <laughs> you go in the bathroom and you scribble notes furiously and you know stuff them in your in your pocket then you go back out in in the group uh, after so that was kind of the the precursor the book when prophecy fails uh, then there's a nice uh, one-page replication of that uh, which says Festinger could be humble not always, but good. A uh, one-page replication done after he was at Stanford. It was a similar group in Nevada, and in this case, he had one of his graduate students infiltrate the group. In this case, the group did, uh, well, the Minnesota group of course, did, totally disintegrated, you know, when the world didn't end. The Nevada group did not. They became even more firmly entrenched because they rationalized that they were so devout in their beliefs that the end of the world had been postponed because of them. And so there's a nice one-page replication. Uh, this is a, a pun in the Journal of Abnormal and Social Psychology called Prophecy fails again, <laughs> a failure to replicate. <laughs> so nice, nice academic uh, pun. But once uh, Festinger was at Stanford, yeah, there was a huge program of, of ex experimental research. And you know, in the, about the time uh, I went back to the doctoral program, he had published a book uh, with, oh, at least eight or ten of these major studies looking at various aspects of the theory. Uh, and I did take his course. I, I didn't know about all the inside stuff. But as, a, as an interesting footnote on Festinger vis-a-vis -vis his own theory, one of the studies they did, of course, this is the early days of warnings about the dangers of smoking cigarettes. And they did a large-scale study looking at uh, people's smoking habits and the extent to which they believed these health warnings that uh, smoking was hazardous to your health. And, of course, generally people, uh, the more they believe the health warnings, then that would be dissonant with smoking a lot hard for a lot of people to quit, but they would cut down. So generally, the more they believed the warnings, the less they were smoking at that time compared to earlier periods. Except perhaps for Festinger. I remember when he came to that study in the course, and he's chalking the results on the board. He has a cigarette hanging out of the corner of his mouth <laughs> with about a one-inch ash on it. And he's puffing away, <laughs> uh, you know. So he's kind of like he, his personal life and his academic life didn't necessarily <laughs> coincide. They seem to be maybe, in that instance at least, compartmentalized. You can imagine, though, Max, I think we both remember how that idea took the advertising community by storm. Because it helped you predict something that I'm not sure the advertising people had thought about it. But who are the people who are most likely to read an advertisement about a new Lexus? Answer is the people who just bought a new Lexus. Because, what's dissonant about that? Because if you buy a Lexus, that means you didn't do something else with that money. And that creates a cognitive discrepancy, according to this theory. See, and you have to 
you have to uh, correct for that discrepancy. Well, you see what's going on. Uh, we had a very senior uh, professor named Farnsworth in psychology who had been through all these arguments about uh, social psychology. And he said, that's simple, old-fashioned rationalization. That's all it is. <laughs> and so you have these disputes within any academic uh, community. Uh, even agenda setting and the knowledge gap notions are not accepted by everybody. <laughs> That's true. As, as we find out. Uh, Max, there was another thing that was going on there that I think we should say something about. But was the study of fear appeals uh, among kids. Yes. You, you had uh, the Bandura studies, for example, and the whole question of the of violent television and its effects on children. And what, what, uh, what was really the state of that research at that, particular, at that particular time? Well, of course, Festinger had his view of that, that, uh, you know, uh, you see uh, something that's violent, and that's contrary to what your parents told you all the time. And, and, but on the other hand, you may say that I identify with somebody else. We didn't really know where we were going with uh, this, and, and we don't uh, uh, yet. Another... Uh, uh, the, the, of course, violence effects and then fear effects. Wilbur Schramm had his version of that. He said it's not a question of what television does to children. It's a question of what children do with television. And he used this perspective to study uh, television in the, in the Pacific Islands, for example, to see what happens. And he came to the conclusion that television can be a great, great learning uh, device. And, of course, much of that reasoning led to Sesame Street and the development of, uh, of Sesame Street. Max, I think we ought to be talking about how you got into this agenda setting thing. Okay. Well, the roots go way back, even though the research itself came several years after, after I'd finished graduate school. Uh, the roots go back to that year that we were both there because, well, quick background. Uh, I went for a master's. Phil was there already in the doctoral program. Uh, the policy at Stanford at that time in communication for doctoral students were, was if you did not already have professional experience, they would support you through the masters, but they would not support you in the doctoral program till you came back with at least a significant amount of professional experience. So after the year uh, that Phil and I were there together, uh, he continued on, finished long before I did. I went back to New Orleans and was a journalist on the Times-Picayune for three years. And, but I discovered this whole new field of communication research and uh, was quite taken with it. And uh, after three years, decided, okay, you know, I had a very cushy, for those of you who've been journalists, I had a very cushy job. I had about a year and a half after I started working at the Times-Picayune uh, been given the state Supreme Court and Civil District Court beat because a very senior reporter who had covered that for centuries uh, had become ill. He had to retire. So I was first put in a, a temporary and then after about two months was given the beat. Well, I say it was cushy because I went into the office at 9 o'clock in the morning. The Times-Picayune's a morning paper. The deadline's 7 o'clock at night. So I'm in way ahead of the deadline. I would confer with the city editor, and then I would walk five blocks over to the building where the state Supreme Court sat. Uh, I had an office there. This is pre-computer days, pre-mobile phone days. I was over there all by myself. Uh, I basically stayed there till about 4.30 in the afternoon. I walked back to the city desk with my sheaf of typewritten copy, turned it in, and I was done for the day. So, you know, if it was a super, super busy day over at the court, and I ran past five, I still had two hours before the first deadline even came up. And uh, it was interesting. New Orleans is an interesting city. The legal part of it 
and the battles lawyers get into is quite fascinating. It was also fascinating to me because I had grown up in Birmingham, Alabama. Most of the U.S. follows the English common law tradition. There's one exception, Louisiana. New Orleans existed as a port before it was part of the United States, and it followed the Napoleonic Code as its basis of its legal system. And once it became part of the U.S., they, the lawyers were not about to junk one legal system and, you know, switch over to another. So uh, it, it's, it's a very interesting approach to the law, uh, led to a lot of interesting lawsuits. So it was that kind of conflict. Well, this is an interesting job, and, uh, you know, and I'm really well positioned here. But I decided to go back to Stanford and, uh, and complete, the, complete the degree. But when I was there as the master's student, there's a long way around to answering your question, uh, one of the books I just read on my own was Walter Lippmann's Public Opinion. You know, I'd seen references to it in undergraduate courses I had taken, but I'd never read the whole book. And, uh, so that was, one of, that was one of my forms of recreation as a master's student, uh, was to read Lippmann, but in a particular setting, because I always said, you know, it's, it's uh, particularly once I became a professor, uh, professors need to develop idiosyncrasies. And one of mine is I love trains, and I like to be around trains. Well, there's a commuter rail line that runs up the California Peninsula from San Jose to San Francisco, goes right through Palo Alto. And there was a nice bench outside the railroad station. It was a wonderful place to go read, because particularly in the middle of the day, there's almost no one there. It's a commuter line. Uh, so I read uh, Lippmann's Public Opinion. Uh, and I, to this day, cite Walter Lippmann as the intellectual father of agenda setting. And if you're trying to explain agenda setting to someone, uh, for me, an easy starting point is to say, well, the first chapter of public opinion is titled, The World Outside and the Pictures in Our Heads, and the Media are the Bridge Between the world outside and the pictures in our head of that world. So the roots go all the way back to that year. Uh, in a more general way, we were both exposed extensively to the uh, Lazarsfeld research that I referred to earlier, Erie County, Elmira. Uh, so I, I became very interested in political communication. Uh, and that continued when I moved on to UCLA after graduate school uh, and was really out of a series of conversations at, at UCLA about uh, media play of different issues and what happens if you have a great story but then it gets eclipsed by even a greater story and pushed down kind of, in effect, the opposite side of the coin of what we mostly look at in agenda setting now. But, but it said, well, the media, the way stories get played in the media affects their perceived importance. So those were kind of the roots. That's UCLA then, uh, uh, thanks to an up-and-coming American politician named Ron, uh, who was governor of California, uh, elected governor while I was at UCLA. Uh, Ronald Reagan's first act was to cut the budget of the University of California uh, by a very substantial amount. And basically each campus was given a quota of faculty positions to abolish. Sounds very contemporary, doesn't it? <laughs> and. Uh, well, I thought maybe it's not the best place to be the most junior member of the journalism <laughs> faculty <laughs> in a highly dysfunctional faculty that couldn't really agree on very much. Uh, so I was uh, offered a, a 
position at the University of North Carolina. I went there uh, in the fall of 1967, which is where I met Donald Shaw. Uh, you know what happened in 1968. Uh, Don and I did the Chapel Hill study, uh, and we're continuing to do studies together. We'll be with two of our doctoral students be presenting a paper at AEJMC in August. Uh, so we've continued to do research together all these years, but of course it's spread out worldwide. Uh, and then I have to you know, add an important personal note. Uh, it's not just been a research collaboration. Uh, I regard Don Shaw as my best friend. Uh, and when uh, my wife Betsy and I were married 23 years ago, uh, Don was the best man in the wedding. On the, uh, the knowledge gap thing, uh, what got me into that, again, goes back to those days when I was a publicity writer trying to transmit information from the agricultural college to the rural people of Minnesota. You may recall a book called Diffusion of Innovations, and written by uh, Everett Rogers. I knew Everett Rogers as a graduate student at Iowa State University. And Everett had taken these ideas from his faculty people at, uh, at Iowa State and, and put them into this book. And this book has, has been, a, been a worldwide uh, phenomenon uh, since then. But anyway, I was uh, well acquainted with diffusion theory at that particular time. And one of the things I was aware of as a, as a writer was that in diffusion theory, you keep finding that the early adopters adopted a much faster rate whether it's, whether it's a new kind of plowing or a new kind of treating crops or the purchase of a new television set or laptops or anything. The early, you have these early adopters who tend to be higher in social status, education and everything. And the later adopters are s slower in picking it up. And I started reasoning that if that's what's happening to adoption, probably the same thing is happening with information. Well then, Wilbur Schramm got me into this project on what the American people knew about uh, science in the early 1960s. And our database, our database was reams and reams, uh, IBM card stack after IBM card stack, of public opinion poll data gathered since the 1930s on what people know about uh, different aspects of primarily medicine and a few things like space research. And so my uh, my job as a graduate student, as a dissertation writer, was to put all of these poll data together into a dissertation about that question, what American people know about science and what's related to it. Well, one day I was looking at correlations, correlations that I had computed with the old-fashioned computers that we had at the time, the correlations <laughs> between education and knowledge. And I started looking at the correlation between education and what people knew about a medical thing called antihistamines. The antihistamines, which was an out, now, of course, an outdated treatment for colds and, and flu. And I noticed, I got to thinking, under what conditions are these correlations stronger? And I noticed that in uh, 1950, those correlations were very weak. And by 1954, 55, they were getting stronger. And I thought, huh, I wonder what's going on here. It was obvious, without doing any measurements, it was quite obvious to me that uh, the amount of publicity, media publicity given to antihistamines had increased in that period of time. And so to me, this was the germ of the idea, that as we pour in more information, the disparity, the difference between different status levels is probably increasing. So I, go, I suggest that to my committee. I had two members of my committee who were uh, very influential. One fellow named Richard F. Carter, Dick Carter, and the other was Wilbur Schramm. Wilbur Schramm said, huh, a knowledge gap. Huh, well, isn't that an interesting thing? I don't know. <laughs> and that was his reaction. I talked to Dick Carter about it, and he said, well, it's one of those things that go anyway. But there's no way you can make a dissertation out of an idea like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I got back to Minnesota, 
ABD, you know, all but dissertation. And I hate to admit this, uh, Max, you're, you weren't going to reveal it, but I will. I was uh, <laughs> there three years before I got the thing wrapped up. And uh, when I did get it wrapped up, I had a big week. My third child was born. I changed jobs. I sold my shotgun and bought a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, working with George Donahue and uh, Chris Oline, we said, we got to take this and put it to a real life experiment. And so we got the, Minneap the Minnesota Poll, run by the Minneapolis Star and Tribune, to cooperate with us in a, in a, a study. We collected some uh, news articles about science that had been published just recently. We went back and through content analysis, we identified those that had been subjected to a lot of publicity and those that had not had much mention at all. So we had a gradation of publicity behind these stories. And we had, this was in the days when polling was still done on a door-to-door -door basis. You knock on the door, good morning, good afternoon, I'm from the Star and Tribune, the Minnesota Poll, I would like to ask you a few questions. They would ask the person to read this news article right there in the doorway and then take it back and say, uh, what do you remember? And then the respondent was asked to re tell the interviewer everything they remembered. And then we, of course, scored these things, measured it, and we found that the correlation fit the hypothesis. And there were several other data that we, we pulled together. And we published the article in uh, 1970. I think it was a couple of years, be actually before the agenda setting article. It was. It was. Anyway, it, I've got to ask you, Max, what, what the first reactions were that you got to the agenda setting article. But the first letter we got was very interesting. It was from a clergyman in South, in the Union of South Africa. He said, you guys are a bunch of communists. That's what you are. <laughs> 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 but of course, there were many other reactions after that. Well, going back, to really emphasize the point, Carter's reaction, knowing Carter, was not terribly surprising. This is Richard F. Carter, not yeah. the Roy Carter, right, who got right. me into Two different for, Carters. For no relationship. Uh, uh, I, from time to time now, uh, give a talk where I talk about the conservatism of the academy and that when you come along with something new, it's often just kind of dismissed as of not much interest. And then specifically ad agenda setting. The, the Chapel Hill study was of course done during the 1968 presidential election. Uh, we did the interviewing in uh, mostly in October uh, of 1968. Uh, Don and I were very excited about this kind of new s approach that used content analysis and survey research. So during the holiday break, uh, we basically wrote the paper. We, it, was, it was done before uh, spring semester began in January. Uh, some of you be familiar with the, I uh, mentioned the Association for Education and Journalism, AEJMC. For decades, maybe forever, the sub date for submitting papers for the summer convention is April 1. Well, Don and I had a paper ready, you know, all, all about two months before April 1. We were just waiting. So we submitted the paper for that summer's AEJ convention. And six or eight weeks later, we received uh, a letter from the program chair basically saying our paper had been rejected out of hand. <laughs> <laughs> they were not interested. Uh, well, we've all faced rejection. And you know how you kind of feel? You have a kind of a tendency to pull back a little bit. So again, this is pre-computer day, so literally this paper went into the bottom drawer of a desk, you know, uh, and sat there for about a year. And Don and I thought, well, this is still an interesting idea. And we thought, well, maybe because the Chapel Hill study was only done with a small sample of undecided voters, that we needed to do it with a full range of voters. And so we began in uh, about 1970, late 1970, planning a 1972 election study that we would do in Charlotte, North Carolina. And it wouldn't be just one wave of interviewing, it would be three waves of interviewing. 
and it would be a random sample of the entire uh, voter registration rolls. And while we're doing that, I said, well, I still think the first paper has some merit. And we sent it to public opinion quarterly. And of course, as, as you know, uh, it was accepted, published, and that launched agenda setting uh, to the world. Well, at least you didn't get 300 rejections like I did for my novel. <laughs> <laughs> and 301 published. Yeah, so. <laughs> I think to wrap this up, I think maybe one point we could make, uh, Max, is that uh, the, early, the early rejections of an idea are often the stimulator for really working on that idea and developing it to where it's really it, it is founded. You get good data for it. You get good support for it. Your logic becomes uh, tighter. And that's one of the precursors to success. <laughs> the early criticism should not overwhelm you. You got to stick with it. Right. Very true. Very true. I mean, literally, after 300 rejections, I started to think I'm in the wrong business. Here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to become a waiter or something. <laughs> but you got to believe in yourself. Exactly. Sure. Exactly. And yeah. uh, what are um, what did you guys anticipate uh, for your careers? in teaching and research in mass communications as graduate students at Stanford, and then how did it turn out? Were your anticipations correct, or, or did, were you surprised when you started working in the industry and actually doing it? Go ahead. Uh, uh, it looked like right out of the starting gate from Stanford uh, that it was going to be a long, slow process through uh, maybe a not very interesting uh, trail. The only job that was open um, that spring that even reasonably fit, you know, what I wanted to do uh, was at the University of New Mexico. Uh, yeah, New Mexico is fine, but it's kind of isolated. And uh, and I remember uh, Chilton Bush, uh, who had long since retired, but who kind of had become maintained his role as my mentor. You know, I went to talk to him and I said, well, you know, this seems to be the, the only decent job that fits what I want to do. But New Mexico's kind of <laughs> isolated. You know, it's a long way from Stanford. It's a long way from New Orleans. It's kind of a long way from everything. <laughs> and he said, well, you may have to go there, but we won't leave you there long. <laughs> Well, uh, by sheer fortune, and now I'm quite fond of that, in beginning with fate is kind. Walter Wilcox, who had been my professor at Tulane, who had steered me to Stanford, by now was chair of the Department of Journalism at UCLA, and he suddenly had a vacancy. And he called, he said, he called like on a Monday morning, he said, uh, can you fly down to Los Angeles this afternoon? <laughs> and I said, well, yes. <laughs> and uh, I ended up at UCLA. And then uh, Reagan got me my job at North Carolina, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> and uh, so then I ended up at North Carolina where I met Don Shaw. And so, no, I, uh, I had no idea where. And uh, I... Don has remained, Don is a native of North Carolina. He did his undergraduate degree there. He went, the only time he's left North Carolina is to do his PhD at Wisconsin. He's back, he just retired from the University of North Carolina. While I kind of wandered around the, the country. Phil, you, you also, you were more stable than I was. Well, I stayed in one place, but uh I had a split appointment. I was in both rural sociology at one quarter of my time and three quarters of the time in, in the School of Journalism. Folks, that ain't an easy thing to do if you're not yeah. psychologically prepared for it. But I, I give myself credit for having worked on it and having George Donahue, Professor Donahue, was my academic counselor when I got back to Minnesota. 
And so when I got into to strains er, very early in my career, he was the guy I went to to counsel, even though he obviously had a vested interest in keeping me interested in real sociology. So we worked out over the years. We had a communication project. And uh, many individuals who are now fairly pro or have been prominent in the field, like uh, Dave Demers at, uh, at, at Washington and uh, uh, Doug Heinemann also at uh, Washington and, and uh, um, <laughs> it was a stage of life. <laughs> uh, McLeod, Doug McLeod at, at Wisconsin, we're in our program. So we always had a mass communication graduate student in our real social program at, at the particular time. And of course, uh, that, that meant a lot to the whole graduate program in the, in the School of Journalism. So we had, we had a lot of activity back and, and, and forth. And I've talked with many other people who've had split appointments around the country and around the world, and I, not very many were able to come through it as, as well as I did. So it, it's a thing that, can, that you can do. Some people do it for a short period of time, and, and the cross-fertilization is always a possibility. But by golly, if you do it that way, you've got to work on it. Thank you so much. That was uh, really insightful. I'll tell you, it's uh, like reliving some history that I remember. From okay, our next uh, presentation uh, is from a couple of people from Turkey. Uh, Dr. Sarah Gorpe, I said her name wrong be to begin with, University of Istanbul, and Dr. Erkan uh, Yüksel from Anna Dolu University. And they're going to talk about their reaction to what we just heard and, and the, the theories, the setting the agenda theory, and every, anything else they want to talk about. So you guys can take it away. Thank you. First of all, we want you to feel free, uh, kind of free, because uh, it's going to be a relaxive uh, presentation. But uh, since it's going to be in, in English, uh, I'm kind of... Uh, strange on that issue because I feel very happy to present this presentation in Turkey to my students but I will try to do it in English right now and would you like to say something yeah. while I studying? just want to say like again welcome to our uh, speech to our address it's uh, really an honor a pleasure to be able to talk about agenda setting in front of uh, you yes uh, now back to you Arkan I'm sure it's a kind of uh, uh, exam for us uh, because our professor, Dr. Makums, is here. So, would you would you two mind moving closer to the center? Okay. And then we can get you both in the shot. If you can move it a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> like this. Okay. I have a question for all of you, and I want you to think about my question. What is the most important problem facing the country in these days? Think about that. What are the most important questions, problems in your country? I have some answers for that. For my country, of course, we have unemployment, unemployment problem, social security problem, education, AIDS, global warming, terrorism, and etc. I'm sure you think that sort of uh, problems. Also, I have another question. How many times have you get chance to meet with one of your political leaders? For example, have you ever met with uh, your president? But I will have another question to you. Have you ever eaten any dinner together with him? <laughs> or have you sit in the same place, in, a, in, a, in the same restaurant, something like that? Have you ever seen him, one, in a close distance, or have you seen him on television? That question was about how do you know about your president? How do you know about your uh, senators? Okay, you don't know actually. And I have another question for you. These are all connected with the agenda setting theory. What is your agenda today? 
you choose to be here and some choose to go to the shopping mall today. <laughs> what are your, your own problems today? And think about that. What have you planned to do today? What you won't be able to do today? Who has decided what you will do today? You decided what to do today yourself. Think about the first question that I asked you. There were some problems that you think these are important problems facing the country today. You said that. But think about that. Are they really your own problems or someone said to you? What's your society's or country's agenda today? What are the problems today? Remember these questions. And who has decided what we will do today for our country? Having an agenda, every society system must have an agenda if it's not prioritize the problem facing it so that it can decide where to start work and where to spend the money, of course. We will start with the history of the agenda setting right now. Sarah? Arkan has uh, given us a lot of questions to think about, and I'm sure uh, instead of going to the shopping malls, we will be thinking about all the important questions. Uh, our preparation uh, consists of actually many slides. Before coming here, and Ar Arkan and I, we discussed about the format of our presentation and the things that we should highlight for uh, an, an international audience of that type. Arkan prepared many slides, but I'm very happy that this morning we got the approval of Professor McCombs. So we will be sharing with you quickly uh, sort of 50 slides. But basically, there are three things that we're going to do. We would talk about the history of uh, agenda setting. We would uh, talk about research. And finally, we'll talk about what has been done in terms of agenda setting uh, in Turkey. Especially, we'll concentrate on the research. And before I start, let me say one thing. When I was listening uh, to you, professors, just before the break, I thought, uh, what could be some of the things that might have changed my life, like when I look at my professional life, when I look at my academic life. And I genuinely feel that, I think it was 12 years ago, I was at Istanbul University, somebody from University of Texas discovered me. So I had the opportunity to go to Texas. And my colleague, who is actually, for Turkey, uh, the person of agenda setting, I could very well say, was there as well. So we had a wonderful time uh, together. And I'm very happy to have this opportunity to uh, be able to talk about agenda setting in front of you all. At that time, we were assistant professors. But <laughs> now we are full professors. And thank you very much for this. Now, as it has been highlighted by you, uh, Walter Lippmann uh, is accepted as the intellectual father of the theory. And his chapter, The World Outside and the Picture in Our Heads, uh, has uh, contributed a lot to the agenda setting. His thesis is that the news media is a primary source of the pictures in our heads about the vast external world of public affairs that is out of reach, out of sight, out of mind, as I mentioned you with my questions. And we just want to go about the milestone, the Chapel Hill study. Uh, and it was first coined uh, in an influential article in 1972 by uh, Professor McCombs and Donald Shaw. The agenda setting function of the mass media was the name of the article. And focusing on the 1968 presidential election in Chapel Hill, the article titled, as I mentioned, published in the Public Opinion Quarterly in 1972, which was my birth, birth year. <laughs> uh, for this study, scholars selected 100 undecided voters because these voters were presumably those most open or they were the ones that were most uh, suc uh, successful to campaign information. Those respondents were personally interviewed in three-week period during September and October 1968, just prior to the election. 
And the survey question was a very simple one. What are you most concerned about these days? Five main campaign issues were mentioned most frequently by the voters, thus measuring the public agenda. They were foreign policy, law and order, fiscal policy, public welfare, and civil rights. The media agenda uh, was measured by counting the number of news articles, editorials, and broadcast stories in the nine mass media uh, that served Chapel Hill. Scholars found an almost perfect correlation between the rank order of the five issues on the, agenda, on the media and the same five issues on the public agenda. Uh, Professor McCombs and Professor Shaw concluded from their analysis that the mass media set the agenda for the public. The core theoretical idea first described in, is that elements prominent, uh, prominent in the media pictures become prominent in the audience picture. And in the words of agenda setting metaphor, this is a causal assertion that the priorities of the mass media agenda influence the priorities of the public agenda. And this is the model of the agenda setting. These are the real world issues, as you see here. Is there a pointer here? I'm not sure. OK, x1, x2, x3. And this is the amount of uh, media exposure I mean, what the media publish and how make them bigger or smaller? How do they see them? And what do public uh, learn from the media about the issues as mentioned with the uh, largeness of X1, X2, X3, and etc. Now we're going to go into detail with respect to agenda setting theory. What's the agenda setting? In short, agenda setting is about the influence of mass media on the public's focus attention, who and what people are thinking about. And when it comes to how it works, the idea comes with the news organizations in the mass media. Newspapers communicate a host of cues about the relative salience of topics in their daily agenda. Silence on the news agenda is the lead story on the first page, front page versus inside page, the size of the headline, and even the length of the story all communicate the silence on the news media. And the public uses salience cues from the media to organize their own agendas and decide which uh, issues are the most important. Recently, we conducted a research on agenda setting in Turkey. We saw this overtime issue there because there was perfect correlation between the fourth week and the agenda of the week, in public, I mean. The agenda of the news media becomes, to a considerable degree, the agenda of the public. Agenda setting refers to the media's capability through repeated news coverage of raising the importance of an issue in the public's mind. Agenda setting theory basically explains how and why the public learn how much importance to, to attach to a topic from the emphasis placed in the uh, news uh, coverage. And we want to make some points clear, especially in Turkish we have some similar uh, verb words uh, which, is conveni which, we which is very relative to agenda. So I want to make some points clear. What is, what is agenda? Agenda means in agenda setting theory, of course, a, a set of issues that are communicated in a hierarchy of importance at a point in time. And another term uh, is issue. Uh, in issue, uh, a conflict between two or more identifiable groups over procedural or substantive matters relating to the distribution of position or resources. There are many social problems that never become issue, even though proponents uh, and opponents exist. Problems require exposure, coverage in the mass media before they can be considered public issues. Therefore, when we think of an issue, we can say that issue is a social problem, often conflictual, and that has received uh, mass media coverage. Another important uh, word or uh, concept is the silence. The task of the so scholars of agenda setting is to measure how the silence of an issue changes and why this change occurs. 
Silence is the degree to which an issue on the agenda is perceived is when relatively important. The salience on the media agenda tells weavers, readers, listeners what issue to think about. And we want to talk about right now some measurement methods of the agendas. The public agenda is usually measured, as we all know, by public opinion surveys in which uh, a sample of individuals is asked a question originally designed by George uh, by Gallup. What is the most important problem facing this country today? And the media agenda is usually indexed by a contents analysis of the news media to determine the number of news stories about the issue or issue of the study. What are real-world indicators? Real-world indicators are often conceptualized by agenda-setting scholars as a single variable in, uh, indicator. For example, the number of drug-related deaths, the unemployment rate, the inflation rate, the number of annual traffic deaths. Certain scholars constructed a composite real-world indicator made up of several component measures of an issue severity. An example is the real-world indicator for the environment issue in the U.S., which included variables from air pollution, oil spills, and spill, uh, soil waste. And now we go back to another uh, uh, important uh, aspect of agenda setting, second level of agenda setting. Yes. This is called attribute agenda setting. Uh, it's a new dimension of the agenda setting. If you remember uh, what was saying the first level of the traditional agenda setting, it was saying uh, to teach people what to think about. And this agenda setting says what to think about. Each of the objects on the agenda has numerous attributes, those characters, characteristics and pro, uh, properties that fill out picture of each object. Just, just as an object, very in silence, so do the attributes of each object. There are two aspects. The first level is the transmission of object salience, and the second le um, level is the transmission of attribute salience. Attribute agenda setting is focused on a subsequent step in the communication process, comprehension, the step that Lipman described as the pictures in our heads. The focus here is on which aspects of the issues, political candidate or topic are salient for members of the public. Issue salience, which has been the traditional center of attention for agenda setting theory, can also be extended to the second level. Uh, public issues, like all other objects, have attributes as well. Second level agenda setting extends our understanding of how the news media shape public opinion on the issues of the day. The media set the agenda when they are successful in riveting attention on a problem. They build the public agenda when they supply the context that determines how people think about the issues and evaluate its merits. And we have some tables that uh, I had presented. Uh, there's these tables in one of the conferences in Poland recently. And think about that. We have lots of studies in Turkey. I'm, I'm not sure uh, with the co total number of the agenda setting studies all around the uh, world, starting from Japan, Poland, Germany, uh, Spain, and US, of course. Maybe f more than 500 or something like that. But there are five uh, dissertation, doctoral dissertations in Turkey, uh, starting with 1997 uh, from Anadolu University. Uh, first one, agenda setting model and the comparison of media and public agendas of the reality on inflation, traffic and social security issues. And the second one, foreign policy and press, an analysis of foreign policy news in Turkish press and agenda setting approach. I will give you some titles of them because there are lots of studies. I don't want to uh, show them all. And of course, my study in 1999, uh, the relationship between economy-based agenda and policy agenda in Turkey and agenda setting study on privatization issue. Okay. Uh, we divided the research part into three sections where we have the doctoral work, the master work, and also some kind of conference papers. 
But I think when we go back to Turkey, that there needs to, you know, sort of update that. And also, if I'm not mistaken, we provided this table for a publication in uh, corporate reputation. But I think rather than uh, looking at the titles, another important thing for us could be when was the first paper on agenda setting uh, had been done uh, in Turkey. And if I'm not uh, wrong, it's in 1991, Erkan. And there is a master 19, thesis, 1990. Yeah, 90. And then, and uh, then yeah. upwards, then we have the uh, doc uh, dissertations coming up. But uh, when I look at the um, adver advertisers uh, of those like master theses and dissertations, and maybe the Turkish uh, colleagues here would correct me, but mostly they are products of journalism departments yes. in mass communication. So uh, our, in our system, like journalism, uh, people uh, concentrate on, on agenda setting uh, more than the other communication disciplines in, in mass com. In the first part of uh, agenda setting studies in Turkey, we see agenda setting uh, while they are making their lit literature review. And they mention, uh, they mention agenda setting as the function of the press. So that's why we have these studies. But they, are, they don't uh, make a test for the agenda setting hypothesis. They only mention uh, within their literature review. And also we have other uh, studies on agenda setting and also academic articles published yeah. in 1991. You mentioned that yeah. from uh, my university it was the same. Agenda setting process on environment issues and uh, Turkish press, example of Halic and Gökova. Mm -hmm. uh, and the later um, academic papers uh, after uh, 2001 uh, that some of those papers that you see are presented in other uh, CIM uh, symposiums. Uh, and Yeah, I'm very happy that uh, every year we have some agenda setting studies in this uh, symposium. Uh, this year we had, planned, uh, we had planned to present another agenda setting uh, study uh, that my students in my class, they conducted. Uh, but we couldn't do that because my student couldn't come. So uh, according to our rules, I can't uh, present two uh, papers. So that's why we couldn't do it. But next year, I promise you, I will show you the findings of that research. We got very uh, high correlation with the fourth week and the uh, media uh, agenda and the public agenda uh, at that theory. So it's very interesting uh, gap thing, I mean, uh, time gap thing. Uh, that we will show you next year. Mm -hmm. The other thing maybe we can say at this point is like we shared with you the graduate work and the academic papers, but there are more to it. But Arkan said, let's not share this. There are books uh, on agenda setting in Turkish. And Arkan, my colleague, is you know <laughs> responsible for the creation of those books. And uh, I believe very recently we also contributed to a corporate reputation book, uh, which was published by Lawrence Erbaum and uh, Craig Carroll, uh, whom we used to work, was the editor of that book. So in addition to those specific research, research topics, there are also uh, some books in, in the Turkish language. I was a, a graduate a student in, in 90, a, at the end of 1990s. And I started to, I made a research on internet and I found uh, Dr. Makum's email address. And then I, I started to send some, my, some of my questions. He says, you bombed me, but <laughs> I, I needed to find the answers of my questions while writing my doctoral dissertation. That's how our uh, correspondences started. And then we came today uh, to the 11th uh, conference, I hope uh, this organization will go on with my students that I have here. Also, maybe it's a kind of news for you. Uh, we are getting older and I have my students, right? Uh, I have my, one of my students here that presented a paper to you as an academician. So I'm very happy uh, to be here with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
this on my belt. Let's Let see. Die. Thanks. I'm trying to get this on my belt. Let me... So, Dr. Roger Rudolph, St. Cloud State University, is going to take over right now. You have the floor. Thank you, Mark. Um, <clears throat> I'm Roger Rudolph, and I am a professor in the Mass Communications Department at St. Cloud State University. Uh, presenting with me today is Melissa Schroden, who is a graduate student and graduate assistant in our MS program in Mass Communications. And I think it's kind of, kind of neat that um, I was one of Dr. Titchener's students so I'm presenting today, and I have one of my students presenting with me. Uh, our presentation is really intended as somewhat of a tribute to Philip J. Titchener. Uh, as a scholar, Phil Titchener's contributions to mass communications theory and research over a pretty long span of time, including Dr. Titchener's work and work that knowledge gap research has spawned in our field, has been very significant. On a personal note, I have real fond memories of working with Phil Titchener as one of my professors uh, in working in my, on my doctorate at the University of Minnesota. Uh, from Dr. Titchener, I learned well how to cast a hypothesis uh, using both existing research and solid logic. Okay, so let's start out on our presentation. Uh, Overview of what we're going to t do today is we're going to review some of the early knowledge gap and what we call structure, structural or structural functional perspective research uh, of D Dr. Titchener. And as he mentioned in his presentation, his mentor, uh, George Donahue and Clarice and Olin, another co writer for, for many years. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about research done on the knowledge gap over a 35 to 40 year period, and there was a lot of research. In fact, I remember talking to Phil Titchener about this a couple months ago, about a presentation like this, and Phil said, there's an awful lot there. And in going back into this literature, I can see what, where he was coming from. Uh, and then we're going to kind of get to the current time and talk about, and I'll turn it over to Melissa at that point, to talk about uh, current research that's real consistent with a, a knowledge gap uh, hypothesis. Okay, so 35 years of research providing evidence of a knowledge gap. Uh, and you can see the gap, but we'll also show you the gap in another way. Uh, and we can see here uh, This really did start, and Phil Titchener was talking about a 1970 article that appeared in Public Opinion Quarterly. And in this article, uh, Phil Titchener, Donahue, and Olin uh, refer to data from actually four types of research, uh, from news diffusion studies, time trends, a case study on a newspaper strike, and a field experiment. And their findings were consistent with a general hypothesis that Increasing the flow of news on a topic leads to greater acquisition of knowledge by more highly educated segments in society. And here we have, I'm going to see if I can get the, I guess I can't do it, but we can see graphically, and I remember seeing this on a chalkboard as a graduate student at the University of Minnesota, uh, that if we look at uh, percent of respondents uh, and uh, we look at information and we look at time, uh, individuals in groups of grade school education, high school and college are acquiring knowledge at different rates. And at these different rates, um, there seems to be a gap. If we look at grade school and we look at college, 
there's definitely a gap. And is that gap getting smaller? Is that gap getting wider? That knowledge gap is getting wider. So that's kind of the basis of what we call a knowledge gap hypothesis. Uh, more formally written, as the infusion of mass media information into a social system increases, segments of the population with higher socioeconomic status tend to acquire information at a faster rate than lower status segments. So that the gap in knowledge between these segments tend to, tends to increase rather than decrease. Now if we think about this from the perspective of media and say a newspaper or say television, what do you think would be the objective of media? For their information to do what? To be disseminated widely through society and to have that information close what we might call a knowledge gap, although we really have found over time that that really doesn't happen. Uh, even something like Sesame Street that was designed initially to help close uh, an education gap between children who from lower socioeconomic status families uh, compared to higher socioeconomic status or higher SES families, uh, the finding over time was that Sesame Street wasn't closing the gap and that children from higher SES families were the ones who were really watching Se Sesame Street more than children from lower SES families. Okay. Uh, when I started working on, on kind of reviewing some of Phil Titchener's work, which I, I hadn't done in a few years, but it was really kind of a, a pleasure to, uh, to do. In fact, I remarked to one of my colleagues, even though I haven't smoked a cigar in, in a couple of years, I said, you know, this is kind of like smoking a good cigar. This is, this is pleasurable um, to, re to be reviewing this literature at this point in my career. Uh, and we also think about Dr. Titchener um, from a structural, functional perspective. And a lot of Dr. Titchener's work in, in rural sociology um, fits really a, a structural perspective. Um, we looked at several studies conducted by Phil Titchener and colleagues that concluded that media choices are related to levels of understanding of public issues and community structure is a principal element of information control. And we looked at a specific study that hypothesized that structural perspectives were more prevalent in less pluralistic or more homogenous rural societies or communities where they tended to perceive less realism in television contexts compared with residents of a more pluralistic and urban communities. And I kind of remember these discussions in Dr. Dr. Titchener's classes. Um, I also remember uh, as a PhD candidate at the University of Minnesota, there was one question on our comprehensive exam that had to do with structural functionalism. And the question was something like, um, in this comprehensive exam, compare and contrast structural functionalism with Marxism and suggest uh, what are the implications for mass communications theory. Well, that was kind of a tough question. Um, and it was tough to figure out how to answer that question. Um, from working with Dr. Titchener, I became pretty convinced that Marxism was really kind of a form of structuralism. That it wasn't a dynamic, revolutionary perspective, but it was really another structural perspective. And that's the, the way that I decided to, to go on my exam, and I, I seem to have passed it. Um, fortunately, the, Marx, the Marxist instructor, Dr. Lee, was in China, so he didn't read my answer, which was probably good. Um, <laughs> Okay, so 35 years of knowledge gap research following Dr. Titchener and his colleagues. And uh, there's been so much research on knowledge gap that there have been three cumulative reviews. Now, I could review each of the 100 studies reviewed in this article, but I think we'd be here till tomorrow. And I think we have a banquet tonight and some other things to do, so we're, we're probably not going to do that. But uh, this one, then I think those two are actually were University of Minnesota PhD candidates or completed their doctorates at the University of Minnesota, reviewed 25 years of knowledge gap research in a narrative that cited over 100 knowledge gap studies. 
1983, 1997, added two more reviews of knowledge gap literature spanning 25 years. Uh, and the cumulative reviews that we just had up, most of the studies that they found were findings consistent with a knowledge gap. And as publicity increases, we still have, have this knowledge gap. Uh, and then I found it a kind of an interesting study from not too long ago. Um, Wang and Jiong conducted a knowledge gap meta-analysis in which they just didn't review different studies, but they actually combined data from studies. And obviously there are some statistical issues and it's really kind of a challenge and to, to do a study like this. Um, so they actually aggregated study from, from, or data from 45, 48 studies. They examined the effect size of the gap, impact of media publicity on the gap, and moderators of the knowledge gap. Uh, their findings did find a positive correlation between education and level of knowledge combining like 48 studies. Uh, okay. As we continue in knowledge gap research, uh, Liu and Evelyn, 2005, attempted to replicate studies suggesting, so as Dr. Titchener kind of alluded to, we always don't find evidence of a knowledge gap and researchers have not always consistently found it, and especially in looking at information gained from something like television, where we may have more participation, more exposure to television uh, by lower SES groups. Uh, we did do have a finding. This finding wasn't replicated, but an initial one was that the relationship between television news use is greater among lower versus higher SES groups. In this study, study results uh, from Liu and Evelyn provided mixed support for a pattern of interaction between moderators of education, need for cognition, campaign interest, depending upon whether the medium of interest is television or print newspapers. So we have a lot of factors that we look at in a knowledge gap study. Uh, we can look at the medium that we're going to be receiving knowledge from or the, that survey respondents are, are more exposed to. Uh, versus print versus TV. And some studies have suggested that there may be some moderators, uh, that there's some intervening variables that just might explain the knowledge gap, such as interest. Obviously, groups that have more interest in a knowledge gap are in, a, in an issue are going to be more likely to pay attention to that issue, whether whatever medium they're, they're looking at. Uh, nonetheless, when we look at this, uh, more recent research, we can say, hey, it's, it's still going on. That some of the pioneering work of Dr. Titchener and his colleagues is still being examined. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa at this point, who's going to bring us real current and talk about some current research uh, on knowledge gap involving what we call a, do you want me to keep flipping? Or? Sure, however. Sure, I'll do it. Okay. okay. Calling a digital divide. So uh, within the past 10 years of studies that have been conducted uh, through or by various scholars depicting how society is now not only imbalanced through the print media and television media, it has been greater influenced or exaggerated the consequences through um, access to internet. Um, these studies have been conducted um, in examining several factors which the knowledge gap perspectives are applied to online environment, including knowledge about international affairs, local communities, and the internet in general. So Frail, in 2011, looked at the ways politics in Spain were influenced uh, by access to outside media sources, and they exaggerated the knowledge gap information amongst the citizens. And also, as stated by Jeffers and colleagues in 2012, the diffusion of literature on the internet adaptation also links social status, particularly education, to the internet with more educated people using more resources that are available. And that lowers the knowledge gap. Okay. Okay, so we, and, and yet, I think we, we we also find digital divide studies that, um, that actually show that, that access to the internet is more likely to be done by higher SES groups 
who have access, who can pay 50 to $100 a month to, for internet connection. Um, we also have some issues going on today where a lot of internet access is being uh, done by a mobile phone, and that's probably a new frontier for some research. How many people have a mobile phone here? Okay, what would you do if I asked you to unlock your phone and pass it to the person next to you? You wouldn't like to do that, would you? Especially if you didn't know that person? It's like sharing your toothbrush. Yeah, it's like sharing your toothbrush, right? Yet, yet mobile and cell phones are being looked at today as, as a form of mass communication, yet they're kind of different. Maybe we can work together with our colleagues in comm studies on this because they're also pretty personal, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they are. Um, if you ask a classroom of students to do that, to unlock their phone and pass it to the student next to them, they'll look at you as a professor and say, excuse me, we usually do what you say, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, and because a lot, a lot of people are 24-7 on a hand handheld device, and um, is that going to be increasing or decreasing a knowledge gap? Can everybody afford a, a, a smartphone? Nope. Nope, not really. So it, I think this kind of research is, is going to be ongoing and is relevant and really goes back to some of the pioneering work of, of Phil Titchener and his colleagues um, that early on identified a communication gap. And I know in talking to Phil over lunch, um, the concept really has not been that popular with media because media like to think that, that they're basically communicating to all of society about important information, right? And that just might not be the case. And, and as we even get into more digital uh, internet environments, whether it's on a, on a laptop uh, or a handheld device, um, I think that that difference over time will probably be more pronounced. So, okay. So to wrap up here, the knowledge gap hypothesis has endured the test of time as information acquisition has transitioned over time from print media to early television, 24-hour uh, cable news outlets, and more recently to the worldwide internet and to what we call a digital divide. So on a personal note, I would like to thank uh, Phil Titchener for joining us today. It was really wonderful to see one of my professors after a number of years. Uh, and. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Titchener for his contribution uh, to mass communication theory and mass communication research. So uh, thank you for giving us a chance to uh, present this today.